All right, well, good morning again, everyone. My name is Dan, and I'm the worship leader and one of the elders here at Calvary Chapel. And uh, Pastor Steve asked me to speak this morning, and it is a real privilege to be doing so. Um, I don't know if you're half as excited to be in the seats that you're in as I am to be standing where I'm standing, but praise the Lord. So as we start today, uh, I have a question for you, and it's a rhetorical question. I'm a public school teacher, and I'm normally asking questions, and kids are yelling stuff out all the time, and so I'm not looking for that, but it's a direct, simple question. Why are you here today? What is the point of you being here today as an individual person? Take it a step further. What is the point of us gathering together corporately? Why, why are we gathering all together here in this room? Right now you're sitting in a worship service, but we were also just very blessed to have Greg and Jillian lead worship. That's confusing. This morning we're gonna take a deep, a deep dive into looking at worship, and that's gonna include both of these things, both the service that we're in right now, uh, the musical expression of worship. You know, as a worship leader, I don't find it, uh, I don't find this an easy topic to talk about. It's not kind of like, you know, Jordan was just talking about the Red Sox. It's not like I'm a scout for the Red Sox and I'm going to give a talk to kids and so I'm going to talk about how to hit a fastball. It's not, it's not like that. I think worship is, there, there's, there's a lot to it. And so we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to kind of dive deep into it today. So I'm going to put a, proje- uh, an, a definition up on the slides for, for how we're going to define worship today. Worship is intentionally giving worth or value through our words and actions. You can think of it as worth-ship, speaking to what something is worth, acting based on that. So when we sing to God, we are intentionally doing just that. We're giving our worth to God through our words. We're speaking about who he is. But if all God wanted from us was four to five songs on a Sunday morning, uh, we would really be missing the point we would be ripping God off, and quite frankly, we would be missing out on a tremendous blessing as well, because it's a lot more than that. Because we as humans, we're designed to worship, not just on Sunday mornings, but Sunday morning all the way through Saturday night. And so just think about that word, design. So stars, stars are designed to do something. They're designed to shine. They're burning balls of gas held in outer space, and they do what they were created to do. They shine. It was intentional. But we as humans, we're designed to worship. And the human heart craves to give worth and value to the thing that is most important to us. And you can see the object of any person's worship life when you look at their life, when you see what they value. Because we all worship something. If someone says that they don't worship anything, they're lying. Because you look at someone's life and you'll see what's most important. There's worship there. So this morning, we're going to look into the life of Josiah, who is a king of Judah from the Old Testament. We're gonna be looking at what it means to worship God with your whole heart. So, why don't you turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 22, and why don't you stand? We're we're gonna read this together. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. The ushers are already preparing some to give out. 2 Kings chapter 22. All right, we're going to start in the first verse here. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jediah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkiah the high priest and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple and have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple, but they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are acting faithfully. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be together today. 
And Father, I just agree with what was prayed earlier. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive that which you have for us today. Father, this, this service, is it's all about you, and we want you to be glorified in every piece of it. So Father, go before this time. We just pray that you would receive the glory you are worth. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So Josiah, he becomes king at eight years old. Do you remember what you were doing when you were eight? I was playing as much baseball as I possibly could. Josiah, he was becoming king. And anything you do at such a young age is really molded and influenced by your family. I think one of the reasons I love baseball so much is my grandfather actually played uh, for in the Brooklyn Dodgers farm system he was, as, a, as a pitcher. And so there's baseball, baseball, baseball. And so I grew up and I'm, I'm all about baseball. Well, let's look at Josiah's family, his dad and his grandfather. So Josiah was the son of Ammon and the grandson of Manasseh. And these are two of the, the arguably the worst kings in the history of all Israel and all of Judah. So Manasseh, his grandfather, he did many, many bad things. He, he built altars to Baal and Asherah. He built Asherah poles. And these were common Canaanite idols of the day. And Baal was the god of fertility. So fertility and soil and fertility and reproduction. And Asherah worship was very sexual in nature. And so as you walk around Boston today, you don't see temples built to Baal or Astra poles. However, the worship of these objects, I mean, you don't have to look very far to see that these are still being worshipped today. And Manasseh had these temples, or had these idols in the temple of the Lord. So what he did is he hijacked the temple that was designed to worship God, Yahweh, and he took these other things, these other idols, and he put them in there. The Bible says he sacrificed his own son. And the Bible also says that he shed so much innocent blood that it filled Jerusalem from end to end. And he did this for 55 evil years. His son, uh, Second Chronicles does tell us that uh, later on in Manasseh's life, God brought judgment upon him. And he did humble himself before the Lord. But, but overall, he was a very evil king. He, he was remembered as evil. Ammon, Josiah's father, he was also evil. One thing that sets Ammon apart from Manasseh is that he did not humble himself before the Lord. So what happened to him, his, his servants assassinated him, and then the people killed the conspirators that planned his assassination. So Josiah, at the ripe age of eight years old, in a multi-generational legacy of idolatry, violence, and evil, becomes king of Judah. So step into his shoes for a moment. Um, what, what would you do first? Like, it's, it's a really hard thing to imagine what the scene was like then. But Chronicles tells us that while Josiah was young, that he began to seek the Lord. So as a young man seeking God while also king, like, the next question is, like, what are you going to do first? There's generations of evil. You're seeking the Lord. You're king. What are you going to do? It's an overwhelming question. So Josiah is going to begin with the visible problem, the temple. In verse 5, we just read, and we will be moving around a little bit this morning, but verse 5 says that he sent money to restore the temple. And this makes a lot of sense considering the temple was the place where God's glory was to dwell. The temple had been built 16 kings prior by, by King Solomon, and Josiah knew that the temple was in disrepair. You'll probably also notice that in verse 7, Josiah did not require the men to give an account on how the money was spent. In other words, he's telling all these guys, spare no expense to restore the temple. And in doing this, he establishes a precedent that he would follow. Never spare any expense to build and restore the temple the way that God has designed and intended it to be. And this ushers in true worship. So we likewise would be wise to spare no cost if there's a need for worship restoration in our life. And there's no price not worth paying when it comes to purifying worship. So Josiah's first attempt to, to write the course of a nation in terms of worship was by building up the building. Now, if Josiah had just built the temple, he may still have been recorded as a good king. But something happens as the temple is being worked on in, in this process. So I'm, I'm reading from now from verse eight of the same chapter. 
Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, uh, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. So Hilkiah discovers the book of the law. In the Bible we hold today, this is likened to the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and and Deuteronomy. And if you've read these books before, if you know your Old Testament, uh, there's a lot in here about what the law required. This is God's law to the people, and as well as an extensive history and a number of other things. And we don't really know this, but uh, this is probably the first time that Josiah is hearing this. So he's desiring to seek the Lord, and he, and he hears this read to him for the very first time from Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. He hears that at the end of Deuteronomy in 28, there's no slide for this, but, but uh, Moses at the end of his life is giving directions for the choices that will bring about blessings in the nation of Israel and the choices that will bring about curses in the nations of Israel. It's chapter 28. I encourage you to read it. It's very, it's very clear. He also, read, he also heard from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which reads, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. So Josiah hears all this, and his response is despair. He knows where the heart of his nation is, He's also learned that he needed to repair far more than the physical temple because there was a severe heart problem in his nation. Because the problem in Judah, it wasn't just the disrepair temple. It was was far greater than that. So again, this morning, we're talking about what it means to worship with your whole heart. Jesus said that the most important commandment was to love the Lord your God, and I'm sure you could finish the sentence, with all your heart. And this word for heart in in Greek speaks to the actual heart. There's no tricks there. Cardia. You can hear the word cardio there. And the interpretation of this in Scripture, it really speaks to the center of the physical and the spiritual life. So in other words, love the Lord your God with all of your life. Like everything. There's nothing, nothing to be held back there. And this is important because God's really not interested in your half hearted worship. He's not interested in my half hearted worship. Imagine ordering a pizza, opening up the box, and finding a slice is missing. You think about it, you're like, There's something's not right here. You bring it back, and you give it back to the guy. And what if his response was, yeah, but the rest of the pizza, it's really good. It's really good. It's great. It's flavorful. It's fresh. Would that work for you? Would not work for me. It would not work for me. Um... I mean, and and a more serious question, how much of your life did Jesus pay for with his own blood? Right? Not 75%. It wasn't 90%, and then I got to make up 10%. He he paid for every last piece of it. And so thus, our offering and our worship to him should be complete. It should be whole. You know, I've been praying a long time about what to speak here, and and this message today, I, I feel like it's one that the Lord's been really working on me for, you know, anything I, I, I teach to you, I've, I've got to learn it first. And so this has been something the Lord's been speaking to me. And this morning in my devotions, it wasn't planned, but I read Second Chronicles 16.9, and it says this, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Calvary Chapel, God is looking to strengthen those who worship with their whole heart, who are fully committed to him. And I believe that God is looking around in, in this room at us right here today, and he's looking to see who is worshiping with their whole heart. So Josiah would worship God wholeheartedly. And there's going to be five things that we're going to take from Josiah's life in, uh, in, in establishing wholehearted worship. And it, it also will wind up in the restoration process of wholehearted worship. So number one. And uh, if, if you're taking notes, Pastor Steve always says that, and I do take notes. I rarely look at them, again, however, it really keeps my mind engaged during the time. But number one is this, wholehearted worship comes from within. 
It was a good thing to rebuild the temple. But as I already said, this would not have solved the worship problem. And external solutions to restoring worship, they always fall short. As the church, we have to ask ourselves why we are here. Is it because there are good programs, fun social events, or is it because we are here to seek and to worship the face of the living God? And in the context of church worship, God is looking at what's going on internally. When I think about what God is looking for, I think he desires to reveal himself in power. And, and actually, that, that kind of came up in the worship set this morning as well. We serve a powerful God. So as we seek him and look to see him move, I would expect that that would also be seen in power. Psalm 22, verse 3, again, quoted in worship this morning, says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Now, I don't want to limit what God may be wanting to do while we are praising him together. I really want to see God's power. And there are several examples of how God has done extraordinary things while his people were singing to him. Again, as we look at worship in a holistic sense, some of this will include music, but, but we're really trying to get at the bigger picture here. So I'm going to share two examples, and both of these come from really obscure places. They did not come from beautiful church buildings. They did not come where everything was set, where there was like a high level of coordination between, you know, what's happening up front and what's happening you know, at the tech booth. Uh, there wasn't a kids program. There wasn't a nursery. There wasn't any of that. And yet God acted powerfully. Paul and Silas, Acts 16, they were freed from prison. What were they doing? They were praying and they were singing hymns at midnight. There was an earthquake. Their chains fell off. They were free. It was a day of salvation for the jailer. Think about the obscurity of that. These guys are in a Roman prison, most likely chained to Roman guards. And at midnight, they're singing, they're, pr they're, they're praising. And at that moment, that's when God comes and he does something really, really, um, uh, really powerful. Their hearts would not be silenced when it came to worshiping God. Another example King Jehoshaphat, who was another good king of Judah. He was met in battle by multiple armies that had joined together, they had ganged up, and they had come against Judah. It, the, the odds were so much larger than what anything, anything that the, the Judean army could fight against. And so what does he do? He prays for God's intervention. It's a beautiful prayer. And then he sends the worshipers, the Levites, in front of the army. So just imagine this. There's, a, there's an army that's, the, the odds are so much larger than what you could uh, realistically fight against. But instead of sending in your best warriors, you say, no, you guys stay to the back. We're gonna put the worship team out in front and we're gonna go into battle like that. Not glamorous, not glamorous at all. But when they get to the front lines of battle, they discovered that God had turned the enemies against themselves. So it means this, while they were singing, while they were worshiping God together, God was doing something so powerful. And I desire to see a piece of this on Sunday mornings. These are examples of what daily worship should look like. It's a, it's a heart that's rooted in God and his love so that worshiping and adoring him, it's just an automatic response in every situation you walk into. But again, the first point was that worship comes from within. And I do desire to see this when we gather in his name together. However, when I look around at what's going on in the American church, I have to just share my heart a little bit. I, I am concerned about a lot of things in regards to what the church sees in corporate worship. Could it be that the church may be playing a part in, in manufacturing an experience? Could the volume of the band or, or the lighting in the room, or the smoke on the stage and singing a perfect chorus or, or a writer writing that perfect song, could this be an external substitute for the real thing that God is looking for? I'm not against great stage production. I'm really not. My career is in music teaching, and in, uh, I do a lot of theater production in my career as well. And so these are elements. I'm not against that. But when I think about these things, um, that's, that's not what God's looking for when his, when his children gather together. It's not an external thing we can make happen. It can't be rooted in our, mo in our emotion. It has to come from inside. It has to come from within. It's an expression from the heart. One way that we corporately express worship together is through singing. Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If we want to see God, 
we need to purify our insides. We need to look inside of our own hearts and see that it is pure. Jeremiah 17.10, God says, I, the Lord, I search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. Think about that for a second. God examines our mind. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and I'm certainly guilty of doing that many times in my life, but God wants purity in thought and motives because God is holy. Again, I'm not anti-stage production. I'm not anti-lighting. I don't have a problem with Christian musician, musicians making a career in songwriting, meaning um, that they're getting paid for writing music that will be used in churches. But my question is this. What is the heart behind all of this stuff? Is, it, is, is that really what we're trying to achieve? Or does this support something that's happening internally? Is it, are we worshiping the living God with all of our heart? all of our soul, our mind, and our strength. God wanted more from Josiah than a rebuilt temple. He wanted hearts that were directed back towards him. So as we get back to our Bibles, we left off there in uh, verse 10, and Josiah hears God's word for the first time. So he's, he's convicted um, with the sin of his nation, and because of this, he's ready to take action. Romans 3, verse 20 says that through the law, we, beca- be, we become conscious of sin. So Josiah is aware, he's convicted, and he's very troubled. So in chapter 23, the majority of it is going to be Josiah unleashing tremendous action to purify Judah and to rid itself of idolatry. So skip over to ch- uh, chapter 23. Um, you know what? I skipped an entire part here. That's what happens when you're not up here very frequently. No. Well, I w- before we get to 23, chapter 22, verse 11, says this, When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes, and he gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Akbor son of, son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asaiah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger, that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Yeah, so Josiah is very, very bothered by this. The the law shows him the sin. He's very, very bothered by this. So skip over to to 23. We're going to read the first two verses. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord where the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. This brings us to our second thing that we see from Josiah's life here this morning. Number two, wholehearted worship, it's rooted in truth. Now, before Josiah acts, he reads the law to to the nation. And I find this really fascinating. It's an example of great leadership. He doesn't have a scribe read it. He doesn't have someone else read it. It says that he takes it and he reads it himself. And in John 4, 23, Jesus says that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. God wants to be worshiped in truth. For there to be true, wholehearted worship, it must be rooted in truth. But the question is this, how can you worship him in in truth if you don't know the truth? The music we used to worship God with, is it rooted in truth? And as a worship leader, you know, from the front up here, this is a a question I ask myself regularly when evaluating worship music because like any kind of market, there's, there's a lot on there right now and you need to sift it through. And when you look at the lyrics of any given song, can you put your finger on the scripture that it's inspired from? It's just a question I have in my mind. Verse three here says, the king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. I hope you didn't miss that last part there. All the people make a covenant to obey God exclusively. 
The people decide to say yes to following God in obedience. And by saying this, this also means saying no to everything else. So practically, because Baal and Astro worship was so prevalent at the time, that hell had to go. And all these things that were competing with the Israelites' worship, the rituals, the sacrifices, the other gods, it all had to go. And anything that's in contradiction with what God says has to go as well. They put all of their eggs into one basket. All the worship was to be pointed to God by doing all of these things. They weren't worshiping um, to choose. They weren't worshiping anything else but God. And you know, we can see this throughout the Bible. We think of the uh, Jesus's call to the disciples when he began his public ministry. Actually, let's turn there. It's in Luke chapter five. This is found throughout several of the Gospels, but uh, I really like Luke chapter five. And so. You know, you know the disciples, they were fishermen. They made their, their livings uh, doing simple blue-collar work, catching fish. And Jesus meets them at work, so to speak. They were having a hard time catching anything. Jesus tells them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat, and then they wind up catching a ton of fish. I'm looking at verse 8 here. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Verse 9, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Verse 11, so they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Our third point this morning is this. Wholehearted worship is singular, and it's narrow in focus. You can't just have it both ways. You can't say a little of Baal here, a little Astra here, a little of this here, and a little Yahweh over here on the side, a little God over there. It does not work like that. Similarly to Josiah, Peter sees who he is in light of God is. Something about that transaction when Peter recognizes that this is Jesus, there's something different about him. He says, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He recognizes his holiness. And there's internal worship happening here. But the thing that really steps out to me in, about, in, in, in this point about our worship being, being narrow, being singular, is the, is the part in verse 11. They left everything to follow him. Now, Peter would have a lot to learn in the next three years during Jesus' public ministry, but his worship of God from this day was, was singular. He was saying yes to following God, and he was saying no to other things. He, he left his family. He left his job which was kind of like his company. Um, He left a huge catch of fish. He left his income. He walked away from all of that to follow a stranger because he knew there was something different about him. And so he follows him and decides to worship Jesus and Jesus alone. Now imagine if Jesus tells Peter to follow him and, and Peter's response was, sure, I will follow you on the weekends. Imagine if he said, follow me. And he said, yeah, when I can, when I can spare time, when there's not many fish to be caught, I'll follow you then. We don't see that. We see, we, we see him leaving everything by itself and him going to follow Jesus. If you're going to worship God with your whole heart, it's going to require you to say no to some things as well. And, you know, I encourage you, as, I, as I've been chewing on this as well, to think about, you know, what, what that could be. Jesus said it well. No one can serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. You can't worship two masters. And the application of this point does take some time. But again, if you look at your life, how you spend your time, that speaks a lot to where your priorities are. How, how, are your, how is your time being spent? This one's uncomfortable. How about your money? Where does your money go? How do you, how do you, spend, how do you spend your money? Tithing is supposed to be an expression of our worship. We're supposed to give it to the Lord and we're supposed to give it joyfully. Worshiping God with a singular and a narrow focus means saying this, God, you are the most important thing and there's no close second. I'm going to situate everything else in my life around seeking you and that is wholehearted worship. As we get back to 2 Kings, the people make this covenant and I want you to notice that they're not fulfilling a biblical piece of the law by doing this. 
They aren't, there was no piece of the Levitical laws saying that they needed to do, to do this. But what we see is a picture of willing, uh, a willingness as they open themselves up to follow God alone. And they're making a public declaration that their worship will be of God alone. And this is a willing sacrifice. And when there is revival in your heart, when all the facets of the heart are being surrendered to God, these things are going to happen willingly. And we see a picture of this here. Number four, wholehearted worship means giving 100%. Now that might seem a little bit redundant. But again, I'm not trying to be super intellectual here. I'm trying to keep this really simple. This means to give 100% of yourself surrendered to God's plan, making 100% of yourself exposed before God. Because remember, he sees our hearts anyway. So, so what kind of foolishness is it to try to think that there's something hidden in here that God's not going to see? He's going to see it all anyway. And, this is, and, and 100% of your heart also search for idolatry. And that's what Josiah is going to do. He's going on a seek and destroy mission to get rid of all of the idolatry within his kingdom. Now, from verse 4 on, there's a lot that I could speak about the actions that Josiah took. But I'm going to read this to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 34. It's a little more concise because we're uh, really only looking at one piece of this today. Um, so 2 Chronicles chapter 34 says this. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them, and he smashed the astral poles, the idols and the images. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Now again, this is, this is a condensed version of this. If you want to see some crazy detail uh, as to his action, 2 Kings 23, verse 4 and on. It's wild. He does not make deals with this idolatry. He goes in and he destroys the every last piece that he can find of it. And it says here that Josiah destroyed the high places. And this is really significant about him destroying the high places because very few kings did this, even good kings. There are numerous good kings listed um, that the Bible records as good, but they did not do anything about the high places. And these high places, I think it's important to understand what this is talking about. These weren't necessarily like mountaintop areas. Like I, I grew up in New Hampshire. I grew up doing a lot of hiking. It wasn't like this, this peak um, far away that's really remote, really hard to get to. These high places, the high is speaking of, of, of worship, like, like high. And these are just places around the kingdom where idolatry was present. The prophet Jeremiah talks about a high place that was built in a valley. And so many of these places, they weren't even hidden. They were in the, they were in the open. And so Josiah takes a fine-tooth comb, and he searches his kingdom for idolatry. He looks in the hidden places, the open places, the common places, the obscure places. He looks over all of his kingdom and destroys anything that had the stench of idolatry. He, anything that did not worship God but worshiped something else, he removed it. The point is to give God 100% of yourself in, in terms of cultivating wholehearted worship. Josiah gives God 100% of himself, the people give 100% of themselves, and then they give 100% of the kingdom. So again, if you know your Israelite kings, you've probably heard of some kings like uh, Asa and Joash, Uzziah, amongst others. And the Bible lists these as good kings. But with the accounts of these kings, there are, there are these sad sentences that accompany what they did as king. 2 Kings 15, verse 3 and 4 says this about Uzziah. Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burnt incense there. These kings were good, but they were not thorough. There are numerous verses like this that describe other good kings that Judah, uh, where Judah had failed to destroy idolatry. And they followed and worshiped God, but they also allowed the worship of other gods in their kingdom. So that's like that pizza thing. That's like, that's like not giving the full 100%, 100%. And so the question, or one of the many questions that I hope that, uh, to, to leave with you today, is are there high places in your kingdom? 
When you take a look at your life, are there places where there's the exaltation of something else besides God? Are there high places in your heart, hidden, where you are worshiping something else other than God? And David said, he said, search me, O God. I can almost hear the anguish in his voice saying, God, just search me. Because our hearts are deceitful. Like these high places that may have been hidden in the open or in a remote place, our hearts have the tendency to deceive us, to hide things. And so that's why we have to ask God regularly, search me, O God, show me what's in my heart, and then to confess it. This message is about worshiping God with your whole heart, not a portion. As Josiah destroys the idolatry, we're going to see the restoration of wholehearted worship. So we're going to skip ahead to this. So what, let's look, we're in 2 Kings 23. I'm going to read just a few verses here. I'm in verse 21 now. The king gave this order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God. As it is written in the book of the covenant, not since the days of the judges who led Israel, nor throughout the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Point number five, this is the last one for this morning. Wholehearted worship is filled with joy. We can see it. The command is this, celebrate the Passover. Yes, the Passover was commanded. They were being obedient by doing this. But there was a festive element to it as well. There was a feast. So yesterday was the church picnic. I would say that that was very similar to a feast. Uh, For those of you who went, imagine if you just attended because you were told to. Imagine if you were just checking off some box by showing up to the church picnic, eating a chicken leg, eating a burger, listening to some people talk, watching a baptism. Okay, got that done. I'm out of here. I'm going home. I was looking around yesterday I didn't see a hint of that yesterday. I saw a celebration. I saw people who were so excited to be together, breaking bread together. I saw a bunch of people I didn't even know yesterday, and that's really exciting to me because, I mean, COVID's been re- really bizarre, but to see people come, coming together and eating and sharing and fellowshipping, I would, I would say that yesterday was more like a party than it was about fulfilling a law. So... If our hearts are fully surrendered to God, here's the point. Obeying his commands aren't going to really feel like a law. It's going to be joy-filled worship. It's going to be it's going to be a pleasure. You're going to enjoy it. It's, there's going to be joy in your heart as you obey what God has told you. Observing the Sabbath. This is rest built into our schedule. We need it. We need to rest. This should be a piece of uh, this should be joy-filled worship. Tithing again, giving back to God is joy-filled worship. Coming to church on time (laughs) to praise God together, it's joy-filled worship. That that should should be happening. Now, I have three daughters, and this story might seem a little um, out of place here, but but it does fit in. And when my wife Danielle was going into labor with Elodie, our firstborn, I remember texting Pastor Steve, kind of asking for prayer. You know, there's anxiety within my heart. I was about to be a dad. Well, um, I mean, I, I, I believe, obviously, the baby was alive. She was alive before that. I was about to meet her for the first time. But I'm watching my wife go through things she's never gone through before. I'm trying to support her. I'm a mess. It's, it's late. Um, for anyone of you that know me, you know, I don't really do well uh, with a lack of sleep. I like kind of things kind of regimented. So anyway, that's kind of where my head is. And I remember sending him a text from the hospital saying something like this. We're at the hospital. Please pray for us. Now, text doesn't communicate emotion, right? It's just, it's just cold. It's just for the words. <laughs> His response, I'll never forget, just said this. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Like, I'm, I'm a leader in the church. I'm feeling anxious. I, I'm looking for a little bit more than that. I'm looking for a piece of comfort. I'm looking for something but that's it. I read it again, Psalm 100. So I did what I'm about to do now. I opened my Bible to that, and I read it. And the first three verses of Psalm 100 says this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. 
Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Pastor Steve, I have to confess, I did not get that for a little while. I was looking for something a little different. And, uh, but I do challenge you. If someone comes up to you and they're really looking for something, just Psalm 100 them. Because over time, it, they'll, they'll figure it out. And I, I, as we look at this, yeah, you can leave that up for a second, for a second, Kyle. Brothers, sisters, every aspect of our lives are to be filled with a joyful worship of God. It's not, to be, it's not to sit in this one place and then we go out for the other six and a half days and do something different. There's no qualifier in the psalm saying, come before him with joyful songs when you're in church. It doesn't say come before him in joyful songs when you're in Bible study. Come before him with joyful songs when you're hanging out with that like-minded Christian. It doesn't say any of that. It just says come before him with joyful songs. And we're told to worship the Lord with gladness in every, in, in every area. And there should be joy. So whether you're in a delivery room or whether you're in this room on Sunday mornings, it's just a call to bring your whole heart of worship with you wherever you go as you leave this place. Don't leave your heart full that's passionate for worship here. Take it with you. The world's dying. I don't know if you've noticed or not, um, but there's like not much hope to be found anywhere right now. And people are putting their hope in all kinds of things and you see it blow up time and time and time again. Now, for those of us who have heard the law, we know this. We know this. There's hope within the heart of someone who's given their life to Jesus because we know how the story ends. But do you know that your, the testimony of how you worship, your perspective of going through a trial, that can be just as loud to, to someone who is lost as it could be giving the, the, the straight gospel because sometimes people need their hearts broken down and, they need to see, and when they see something different, they see someone going through something and they say, wow, I would go through it like this, but this person, they don't look like they're too banged up by what's going on. There's a bad circumstance, and they're going through this with their head held, head held high. How do you do that? Well, we all know that we can't do it on our own. It's because, it's because of the Lord. The way you worship is a light to, uh, can be a light to those who do not have the, dark, who do not have the light, the people who do not have Jesus. So we're going to close here. And I, uh, Greg, Jillian, and the team, you guys can come on up. And we're going to have people up to pray as well. You can also come up at this time. You know, I've kind of said a lot about worship holistically today through these five points and some about uh, the musical expression of worship. But I, you know, when COVID hit last March, I really became quickly aware of how much I, I missed worshiping in this room with you all. For those that were here before and here again, like that, that really, that was really, really, really challenging for me. The sound of congregation uh, fill, uh, voices raised here, it was replaced with just my own as I'd sit in a corner of my house looking at a video monitor during the live stream production. I'd sit and I'd watch Pastor Steve deliver the word each week by himself, and, and in many ways, it was a lonely season. I do remember gathering with the elders last summer, it was like the first in-person thing, and, and we started singing, and you know, I'm, I'm not a terribly emotional, emotionally expressive person, but I remember not being able to sing because I was just so choked up by it, because the, the sound of other people's voices raised in one accord to worship God together was something that I'd so missed. And I pray I never take a Sunday morning for granted ever again here gathering here together. But during that time, it was, it was also a time of, of deep reflection for me. I would ask myself questions like this. God, do I love you enough to praise you in obscurity? I remember last Easter, you know, at the time my wife was, was pregnant with our third daughter and she was, had served in worship for, for years and so we're thinking, oh, we're, we're home. It's a live stream. It's an, it's an example, uh, an opportunity for us to, to be together, to be the worship team from our house on Easter Sunday. We had it set up perfectly, something for our, our kids to be doing while we were doing this, but one of them couldn't, just had, a, had an issue. And so Danielle had to go uh, deal with, with that child. 
And so it, it just left me sitting literally in a corner of my room at a piano on live stream. And, and the Easter service, this is like the pinnacle of, of the calendar year in terms of celebrating and worshiping the Lord. And that, and that was stripped away. God, do I love you enough? If, if we never get back into the Longwood room, if we never get back together, do I love you enough to worship you until my last breath? And that's a question that's been, that's been sitting with me. So I gotta ask you the same, the same question. All these questions I've raised this morning, they're the ones I've been thinking about for a while now. Kyle, you can bring up the, the last chart here. And so here are all, all five of these points here today. The first one about wholehearted worship coming from within. Am I worshiping from within or am I looking to something external? Number two, it's rooted in truth. Am I worshiping in truth? Do I know the truth? What's my knowledge of the Bible like? Do I know God well enough to worship him in truth? Number three, am I worshiping God alone? Is there anything else that's crowding my eyes from seeking the face of Jesus? Maybe you've gotten distracted from seeking the most important thing. Number four, what percentage of my heart belongs to God? Am I really giving him the full thing? Am I giving him 100%? Am I giving him a piece? Am I giving him what feels like 100% on one day of the week? What's the other six days look like? And number five, is my offering filled with joy? Are there places in my life where, there is not, where worship is not happening? If you look at this, and, and Kyle's going to leave it up for a minute, um, and you see something, a piece of it that, that's missing, I encourage you to come up. Pray with one of the couples up here. Restore it. Restore your own worship life. Give God your whole heart when it comes to worship. Lord God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you, that you for your great, great love for us. God, while we were sinners, you died for us. There's nothing we had to offer you. But yet, Lord, we, we know that it was, it was your precious blood that paid the penalty for us. And, and God, as we evaluate our own worship lives, Lord, I just, I just do pray that, Spirit, that you would just have your way, you would expose things. Lord, that we would give you our whole, our whole hearts. Brothers and sisters, let's stand as uh, the worship team um, closes. And Lord, I just pray as well, Lord, I just pray for anyone in this room that is, has not decided to, to seek you exclusively, who has not made you their Savior. Let today be a day of salvation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.